Hello again, my name is Mark Baines and this is Training Made Fun. Welcome to part four of six on assessments of the first personal training client session. Make sure you've reviewed the first three videos before going forward here so everything makes the most sense. That said, we're now talking about the third basic concept or third basic idea of what we're assessing the first time we meet our personal training client or potential client. Uh, the first two things were resting heart rate or talking about heart rate and what heart rate should be, uh, where we expect it to be, uh, and then of course also uh, blood pressure. Now we're on to weight. Now a lot of our potential clients or clients are going to be many times obsessed about weight. Uh, particularly for those people who are obsessed about their weight or really worried about their weight. We want to try to get them to assess no more than once weekly, not get on that scale any more than once a week. There's nothing wrong with, with weighing, weighing uh, more often than, not, than that. However, the fact is, is that not a lot of change positively is going to occur real fast. Uh, water changes can occur very, very quickly. Um, some changes in gastrointestinal bulk from what you eat can change. Uh, hormonal effects can have some change of a few pounds, give or take, over the course of a day or two. So muscle and fat takes much longer than that. So the things we're really trying to assess for long-term change, we need to assess a lot less frequently. That said, we want people to be able to take a look at what's going on. We really want to have the opportunity to have the person weigh themselves and talk about what's going on. It's not uncommon for someone to weigh themselves a week after beginning an exercise program and being pretty consistent with their program and eating better and taking better care of themselves, getting more sleep, trying to reduce their life stress. Remember the big four. It's not just about exercise and nutrition. and It's definitely not just about nutrition. That's ridiculous. It's about exercise, nutrition, uh, life stress, and sleep. The big four. You've got to have all four things you're working on, at least to some degree, right? That said, uh, weight might not change. Maybe you're getting better rest and your life stress has gone down in the last week uh, and you're exercising more and you're eating better, at least as far as you can tell. But the weight hasn't changed a lot. The body is very, very smart. It will try very, very hard to maintain where you are. It's really important that your client understand that and that we as personal trainers understand that. The body is very, very intelligent and competent at its job. It recognizes that when someone's doing something drastic, like these, a lot of these diets that tell you they can lose tremendous amounts of weight in a day or a few days or a couple weeks, and they can. You can lose several pounds in a day. You can lose 15, 20 pounds in a week. All sorts of things like that. Some people have actually gained lost more than that, right? That said, None of that is long-term uh, able to be sustained, okay? And it's going to be short-term numbers that are going to improve. Long-term problems are going to happen from that. Hormonally, nervous system-wise, you understand more about what's going on there. You look at books like Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky, uh, The Cortisol Connection, and other books that understand and helping you recognize more what's going on with long-term stress, not just immediate changes for weight changes. Uh, I'm not talking about martial artists or boxers or fighters who make changes in weight because they're doing it for their sport. We're talking about sport. Here we're talking about longevity of overall well-being and health, something sustainable. People aren't looking to make their weight change for tomorrow and only tomorrow. They want their weights to change for good. So to keep it, to change, keep it at that point of getting better on a regular basis, we have to be much more conscious of what's going on on a day-to-day -day basis. And you can't make changes that fast. You need to look your clients or potential clients in the eye and say, look, I know you want the weight change by tomorrow. I know you want a big weight change by next week. But I need you to understand that if you get on that weight, that scale, and you see your weight, and you've even maybe gained a pound or two, you can't let that become the basis for what's happened the previous week, especially when you know you've been engaging in proper behaviors. There are countless numbers of individual physiological factors which no one can fully understand about a given individual without very expensive testing and knowing about every possible potential variable about that person's biochemical properties and their own individual stress on a day-to-day -day basis. Without knowing those things, it's hard to say exactly what numbers we're going to see. And that said, if we see drastic numbers, we're going to see some drastic bad things happen long term. It's just that simple. So we want to see changes occur more gradually over time. And what's really going to happen is a few months down the road, things are going to happen very, very fast. But it starts slow. Positive progress begins slow, then picks up more and more so. So when someone's engaging a proper program, we're going to come back to this concept over and over again at the workshop and in these videos. Proper progress starts slow at first then seems to come exponentially as time goes on. Progress that's not ideal gives you exponential early progress and then nothing within two, three, four months. Because it's not the ideal program for your body. And that's why. 
The body is smart. It realizes whatever you've done is not ideal and says, don't you worry. I know this thing you're going through right now, this high stress program you're putting yourself through and not eating anything and you're working yourself really super hard. We realize that in order for you to keep doing this thing, you're going to have to be lighter weight. So we're going to help you out and help you get there. But we also understand this is not normal for you and not really a good thing. So don't worry. We're going to do our best to get you back here again. We're going to fight to get you back to the weight you were before. We're going to store water at a higher rate than you did before. We're hormonally going to be imbalanced now, so we're going to actually need to lower that metabolism so we can help you get back to where you once were, okay? Your body's too smart. Don't try to outsmart it. Give it gradual progress, not the world by tomorrow, okay? Now, we do want to measure before and after the workout for body water changes due to sweat loss. If you lost a pound or two pounds or three pounds, or in some like a, a Bikram yoga or a hot yoga type classes, we're not even at class where the temperatures are 100 degrees and, and above, well above some cases. A um, person can lose three, four, five, six or more pounds of water during that time. They have to drink one and a half to double what they lost over the next three hours to recover, ideally, from that stress and re replenish the body water that was lost. Uh, it would be nice that I was losing uh, fat during that time frame. It doesn't happen like that. Your body's too smart for that. You can't lose fat like that. In fact, you cannot lay, lose or gain any more than one or two pounds of muscle or fat in a given week, max. Let's be clear about that. If you actually did do that, that'd be 50 to 100 pounds of muscle and fat over the course of a year. That'd be phenomenal. And being that, majority of weight change, well, water, we should say, is 45 to 65 percent of your body's chemical or total mass, chemical makeup or total mass. That said, so when you lose 10 pounds, you should expect four and a half to six and a half pounds. That's water. Okay, uh, the other three and a half to four and a half pounds, or four and a half to five and a half pounds, is what's going to be muscle and fat. And you can't gain muscle without gaining some fat. Muscle is intracutaneous fat that is always present in muscle. Now it's a lot more muscle than fat. There's going to be fat there too. You can't have all muscle and no fat gain. It doesn't work like that. And when you lose uh, fat, you're going to lose some muscle too. It goes that way too. And what you can't do is you can't do a Calper test and say, you just lost four pounds of fat and you gained eight pounds of muscle. How do you get that by measuring millimeters to the skin level? You can't do that. We're measuring change, yes. Hopefully positive change, assuming the person's engaging in positive behaviors. But don't let that number be the only number you look at. And Calpers are coming up. So looking at Calpers and other body fat testing procedures, uh, we're talking about uh, hydrostatic weighing, near-infrared reflectance, calipers, and biological impedance, which are the four of the more common methodologies for measuring body fat or body fat changes. We talk about body fat as a percentage. Uh, remember we mentioned in earlier videos, uh, if you are 20% body fat, then 20% of you is fat mass. 80% of you is what we call lean body mass. Uh, that would include the water, which is 45 to 65% of you, and the rest of you, that's the muscle, the bone, the tissue, and everything else. That said, uh, more ideal for women in general, this is very, very general. We're not trying to hold people to this exact standard because it's more of a general concept or idea. Uh, high teens for the women and lower teens for the men. Obviously, if someone's 70 or 80 years old, these numbers are not going to be quite the same. But we're talking about someone anywhere in that 25 to 45, 55 age range. You're going to see some numbers in here. They're going to be more ideal, meaning by ideal, generally speaking, not always, uh, these people tend to have the least health hormonal issues, nervous system related problems, and chronic disease, okay, when they're in these rough ranges. It's not perfect, nothing ever is, but that's why we talk about it more, which is I really say more ideal, but that's really the idea. Obese, a female is above 35% body fat, or as we said before, above 35 inches at the waistline, that's an area of concern. We don't have to tell anybody that they're obese, they know this. We simply measure them and say, that's the number we want to see come down. Probably have to even say that. They probably already told you that. Anybody who has a waist size, a female 35 inches or greater, or body fat, 35% body fat or higher, and is seeking your help, is probably going to tell you from the right from the get-go they want to lose weight and they know that it's a problem or concern for them. You don't have to even say a word. We just know it's something we need to work on longer term. The males, uh, low teens, and we said it was too high. If the 25% Body fat is too high, but 40 inches waist size is too high. And remember again, the biggest, more concerning number is if that waist size, the belly button measurement, is equal to or greater than the hip measurement, which some people say is the largest part of the hips. We actually use one hand breath below the belly button, so you have the same measuring line every time you do the, the uh, hips. That's just our suggestion. However you do it, make sure it's the exact same way every time, so you know how to measure change, right? Something repeatable, okay? That said, Hydrostatic weighing is underwater weighing. 
you do in a bathtub and you get in a rack and you lay in the, go in that bathtub and they measure your, your body weight in that on that rack and then you have to breathe out all of your air and based on the Archimedes principle or the buoyancy of water they can get a pretty good estimate someone's body fat sometimes they'll even have something as big as almost like a little mini hot tubs type sized thing where you go completely underwater and breathe out same concept it's fundamentally flawed like all things are because it assumes the person is breathing out all of the air completely they're not they're actually relaxed enough they can do it they're not going into it sick and not feeling well so they can't or they're not breathing so they don't have a breathing issue whereby they can't breathe out completely or normally. There's a lot of things that can go into it, even though it technically it's one of the most accurate methodologies for it. It really is an accurate methodology if all things are performed properly and the machine's calibrated properly. It's actually the one we're using as our gold standard, meaning the NIR, the calipers, the biological impedance are measured against it. It's not perfect though. It just isn't. Okay, but it's a number we want to use like so many other numbers. That's an overall view of what's going on with the person as a whole. No number by itself is significant by itself, barring some sort of chronic disease issue that a doctor has identified, right? Uh, near infrared reflectance, NIR, is a wand, like it looks like a microphone, little tape recorder, wand of the dominant bicep. And based upon uh, basically the infrared light is actually the same methodology that's used for measuring uh, meat uh, fat. For your meat packing, they use the same exact methodology. It can be very accurate. It's more accurate and consistent, consistently, uh, we should say, with uh, used with older individuals and overweight individuals. Uh, bodybuilders throw almost all these off to some extent because all the factors that go into the statistical variations that are used in the uh, calculations for all these different things rarely take into account uh, what, a, what should be different with a bodybuilder who, who is different in so many different ways in terms of a typical mass of a human being. That's why, honestly, body fat measurement is a general whole. It's really inconsequential for a, for a bodybuilder other than something they can brag about and talk about. If they're looking the part, that's what they're more worried about, not worry about other things. So aesthetics as a whole is something significant for a lot of people and totally understandable. We're talking about specific body fat. We're talking about the average person, general people, general fitness, uh, older people, because with calipers, uh, basically pinching the skin can actually break the skin, even though it's not supposed to pinch. Even the slight variations on some people can be problematic, and NIR is less invasive, but it is more expensive. It costs anywhere between a few hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars for a piece of equipment that does this. But it's highly recommended if you have a lot of people you're training that are older, meaning 55 years of age or specifically absolutely 65 years of age or older, and particularly overweight people that are in that 25% plus body fat category. Uh, those kinds of people are going to get a lot better, more consistent numbers. It's a lot less invasive, easier to use for those people. Like all methodologists we're talking about here, the only way we're going to know for sure if it's accurate for the individual is to measure more than once with that individual and look for variation. If the variation is significant, you got to retest. You're not going to get an accurate measurement. CalPERS. Uh, we're talking about typically using the Jackson Pollock method, three site, the five site, seven site, 12 site methods. All those methods measure more areas. A lot of people tell you you've got to measure the body fat, upper body, and lower body. We have to measure more areas. It's just not true. They have to understand calculus. If they understood calculus and algorithms, we could talk about whether it was more statistically accurate or um, more reliable or valid. But unless they understand those concepts, we really can't talk to whether it's accurate or not. But what we do know is when you actually measure only three sites, if you're measuring a couple of millimeters off, you're not going to see as much variation. If you measure five, seven, or 12 sites, and you're off by a millimeter or two at every site, that person's body fat is going to be three, four, five percent high or low. So that's why we highly recommend three site not 5, 7, 12, or any number of uh, variable sites. For the women, it's always the tricep uh, between the, the shoulder and the elbow. The men's the diagonal fold between the, the nipple, and it's always on the right side, and the shoulder right in the middle there. And the women is going to be on their side, the diagonal fold off to their side on the right side, directly straight out from the belly button. And the men's right next to the belly button on that right side. And the women, it's going to be on the middle of the thigh, and the men, the middle of the thigh on their right side. Okay? And that said, and we test it again, see if it's accurate. If you're within uh, 0.1 or 0.2% body fat, you're measuring it just fine. Make sure you measure the exact same way every time you do it, and you be the one who measures it, okay? Biological impedance, um, you ever put your hands on those machines, it gives you body fat, but just put your hands on it, or your feet on it, or hands and feet on it. 
uh, in a laboratory setting, this was very, very, very accurate. But they also have electrodes on fingers and toes, and they're lying down supine on a, uh, basically on a gurney or on, a, on the ground, right, or a bench. Um, this te testing methodology is not done that way. So there's some variances here. But like all things, what we're looking for is, can they measure it? They get on there and it says 15.6% body fat. They step away, come back, says 15.5%. We're doing fine there. That's a methodology that might work for that particular person. It's based on the concept of measuring the water content of someone's body. If their water content is variable, or the machine's having a hard time reading that, they've gone to the bathroom recently, they've worked out recently, uh, they've ingested or gotten rid of a lot of water recently, uh, those things, could, body heat changes can actually change that too. So a lot of things can go into changing this test. Like all tests, just like measuring the weight, you want to do it the same time of day you do it, when you do it, and be consistent about when and how you do it to get the most accurate measurement what's going on. You're going to find the test, whichever it is, that's accessible to you, that you can afford to do, you know how to do, but that more than anything else gives you reliable, consistent uh, measurements so you know what changes, if any, are occurring. Okay. And girth measurements are really going to be your best friend, honestly, for measuring someone who wants to get bigger or smaller. Uh, you want to become really good at like a tailor and actually measuring uh, basically the middle of their shoulder, around their body, uh, the chest, nipple line, the belly button for the waists, the waist, <laughs> okay, the hips for one hand breadth below the belly button, the uh, legs just below the gluteal fold of the of the uh, legs of the glutes, okay, and of course the calf, largest part of the calf. A uh, neck you can do as well. Some people do it, but you want to get really good at it. You want to have the person hold it when they're measuring chest or waist or hips. Have the person hold it in a place, the midpoint in their chest or a midpoint belly button or holding it at their belly button or just below the belly button for the waist there, and then you will be on the side. They'll run, they'll turn around completely, and you'll hold it and actually hold it and measure it at the back slightly to the posterior side of the person's body on the right side, so you're not actually actually being invasive and reaching around someone when you do it. You want to practice like all tests a lot, so you can get very, very good at doing this test. You'll find a lot more uh, recognition of what's going on in a short period of time, the first three or four weeks of an exercise program with girth measurements than you will with the weight and the body fat changes in most cases. In a lot of cases, people are seeing they get on the scale, and they've gone down only one or two pounds, body fat's changed maybe a percent, and yet they they feel like their shirt's fitting better, or their pants are fitting better, they're falling off now a little bit, or, or they're feeling more firm, or whatever it is. Girth measurements will show you that exact change, and it's a, probably a better way to go to get your client focusing on that from an aesthetic standpoint, which is really what they want anyway, right? They want to look in the mirror and see what they like what they see. That's what they're worried about, not the number on the scale or a number in a body fat percentage. And the girth measurements are going to have a much better picture of what's going on in that regard. And of course, this concept of kinetic chains we're going to review uh, in mostly in the workshop. We'll talk about generally here, the actual hands-on application, like so many things, or what comes from the workshop. This is more to give you an overview to understand what's going on. The uh, workshop itself is going to give you the more details on these concepts. But the kinetic chain is, if you recall back, we talked about it in the back of a couple videos before with assessments in the first client session and in kinesiology, uh, the kinesiology section in functional anatomy. Uh, the kinetic chain is basically a concept of three different systems, right? The muscular, the nervous, or neural endocrine, ideally. Neuroendocrine, the muscular system, and the skeletal system. If any one of those systems is thrown off, they're all thrown off. If you're tired and worn out, the nervous system gets thrown off. Throws off the communication with the muscles. Get to improper movement of the skeleton, right? If you're not getting the proper foods, same thing. Throws off the nervous system first, let alone have a difficulty replenishing and uh, providing enough ATP for the muscles to perform their work. So the nervous system is trying to get the muscle to do its job, and the skeletal system can't um, stabilize properly because there's miscommunication between the other two systems. And, of course, you have an injury specifically related to the skeleton or the muscular system that throws off the nervous system. All of those things play a role. That's why you often hear people talk a lot about preventative exercise, uh, preventative inj injury uh, exercise focused or focus or why people do physical therapy, or why people do balance training or flexibility. They're trying to avoid miscommunication from these systems so the body performs as good, well as possible to avoid future problems and alleviate past problems, which of course is the goal, isn't it? We want everything to work as a more integrated whole in a positive way. Now we gotta be careful about how we do that, like so many things. I wish it was so simple as, here's the right program for everyone. There's no such thing. We're gonna talk more about that in the videos to come. This has been part four of six for assessments in the first client session. We'll have parts five and six up next.